Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Green, for that powerful song. Thank you more for Jesus Christ and his blood. Glad to know that uh, we have some folks who are still saved in this church, who are still alive in this church. Sometimes I wonder, singing about Jesus Christ, the blood, a new name, and all these things, and boy, you could, you could almost sit through the second coming of Jesus Christ, it seems like. But I'm glad to see that some of you are alive and awake tonight. I appreciate that. Have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Palm Sunday. What does Palm Sunday mean to you? What does it mean to me? What significance is this Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ? Many times in my past, I could go through Palm Sunday, triumphal entry, and, and not ashamedly give it more than a passing thought, it seems. And this year, coming on this Easter, it's Resurrection Sunday, the Lord led me to spend a little more time on this for the church, for us, for me. Around the world, people have different responses, different actions on Palm Sunday, on Palm Sunday in one country. They have competitions to see who can make the best Palm Sunday decorations. The winner is receiving some pretty nice prizes. Palm Sunday reduced to a competition like a common sporting event. I'm told that there's places in the Philippines that they weave palm leaves into intricate and complex shapes bring them to church where they can be blessed and then taken back to the houses so their houses would be blessed as well. Don't bring me something you've made to bless. I have no power in me to bless anything that you have. We are blessed because of Jesus Christ and His gracious gift, but I can't bless anything. And and no man blessing that in these current days would bring any goodness to your house. Jesus Christ and God does everything good. Every good gift, every perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variables, neither shadow of turning. I'm told in the Netherlands, they have big parades and the children carry crosses with a bread, baked bread rooster on top. could make this up. Other places, they'll decorate houses with cute painted eggs for Palm Sunday. I'm told in Haiti, they will mingle Palm Sunday Christianity with voodoo. And they'll mix those two things on the same, on the same day. Other places, children will run up and down the street, house to house, and they will exchange, exchange palm branches for coins. It's a nice way to say they sell palm branches on Palm Sunday. Make some extra cash for their pocket. Palm Sunday, what is this day all about? I read this little cute story one Palm Sunday years ago, a five-year-old Stephanie sat on her aunt's lap while they listened to the pastor's sermon from this passage or one like it in Matthew chapter 21. As the pastor described Jesus' approach to Jerusalem and how the, cry, how the crowds cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, Stephanie perked up and began to sing, Oh, Hosanna, now don't you cry for me. But I fear that we would be guilty of confusion on Palm Sunday as well. Significant day, powerful day, what Jesus did, what God did. I believe in Palm Sunday there are three components that I'd like to direct our, our attention to tonight from this passage. I'd like us, if we can, in some way, shape, or form to kind of put ourselves with this particular account. I have, Pastor Scott, if you'd help me bring those, those items, I had uh, some things obtained for tonight, some palm branches. We're going to put them down here, down front. 
And they'll get them out there for us. What if Jesus showed up tonight? He's here, right? He's here. But what if he walked in the back doors tonight? What if Jesus walked in the back doors and needed something? What if he asked for a path to walk? What if he asked for your palm branch, for your coat? Would you give it to him? Yes or no? Would you give it to him? You better believe I would. I'd run home and grab some more coats if I could. This day, a significant journey Jesus took on the Mount of Olives on a path covered with branches. Thank you, gentlemen. If you look at Matthew chapter 21, I'd like to again read that passage. Beginning in verse 1, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, they were come to Bethage, to the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them. And straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Sion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt the foal of an ass. The disciples went, and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sat, set him thereon. The very great multitudes spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Lord, I'd ask these next few moments we have that our hearts would be strengthened, encouraged, and challenged. Lord, help me as I present some things from your word. Lord, I don't know that any way I could do justice to your entry. But Lord, for a few moments, a few minutes, Lord, would you open our eyesight to the power of the truth from your word. Lord, may our hearts be touched and challenged and encouraged. Lord, may we never cease to praise your name. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Jesus was top of Mount Olives about a Sabbath day. The Bible says a Sabbath day journey from Jerusalem. We know the distance is about a half a mile. Not very far. Half to, a half mile you could comfortably walk in 10, 11 minutes. It was what a Jew could walk on the Sabbath without being in trouble with the law, the Jewish law tradition. The Sabbath journey. He was up here now that the last week of his life had now come down to the last, the last few days of his life. Disciples, the Bible says, when this was all done, reflected back upon this. But in the moment, in the moment, they missed all of this. In the moment, they missed what was going on. Looking back, uh, Matthew identifies this. The disciples identify that. But in the moment, they, they missed the significance of what was happening. And I fear, Christian, I fear, fellow saint, that often we miss the significance of what Jesus has done and is doing. And tonight I want us not to miss what Jesus is doing and what he has done. I see three components I want to encourage your heart. The first component I see is the component of prophecy. 
Jesus came into the, into the, uh, came to the city. The Bible says that all this was done that it might be fulfilled, verse number 4, which was spoken by the prophet. When Jesus came into the city, Jesus was not just coming into the city, not just coming uh, into a nice city to do, some more, to do some more healing or do some more miracles. He was coming to fulfill prophecy. The Bible says in Zechariah 9, verse 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. The, the Bible in Zechariah spoke of what Jesus would do, and that's exactly what Jesus did. He came as a king into the city of Jerusalem. He came as a king uh, on a donkey, you see, uh, to ride a colt. To ride that was a sign of peace. And Jesus came meek. He came the first time into Jerusalem with a sign of peace and salvation. I am told that in wartime, a peaceful king would ride in on a city this way. It reminds me... It reminds me of what the angels said in Luke chapter 2, verse number 14, announcing the birth of Jesus Christ. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, help me, peace. Jesus, to fulfill prophecy, came in peace. Jesus brings peace in our life. Jesus is peace for a troubled soul, for a troubled life. He came to fulfill prophecy of a king, and he came in peace. May I remind you, though, that the next time Jesus comes back to this earth, he'll come again up here, and we'll meet him in the air. But the next time he comes to this earth, he will not come in peace. The Bible in Revelation tells us he will come on a horse, a horse there in the Bible, a symbol of war and of battle. At that time, he will, he will come and he will be victorious in that great battle. But this time, he came in peace, but next time he won't. He came to fulfill prophecy, the prophecy of a king, but also the prophecy of a prophet. In Deuteronomy chapter, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 15, God says this, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. You see, the Jews had all of these prophecies. They had all of the head knowledge, but they had none of the heart knowledge. It was up here, but it wasn't right here. They're saying things that they should have known and should have connected, but they didn't. The prophecy of a prophet and the prophecy of provision. Studying this timeline, Jesus came into Jerusalem with accounts as they coordinate on the 10th day of Nisan. You say, well, Pastor, that's very interesting. It is when you compare that to Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Where the Bible tells us, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. The tenth day of Nisan was significant because that was the day that the Passover lamb was selected. And the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem was the day that physically these people chose the lamb for Passover just a few days later. They missed it. They were too busy picking this lamb when this lamb was before them. I've got to remind you of what Abraham said to Isaac, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Can I remind you what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus? Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You see, Jesus came in prophecy. May our hearts be touched. May we be challenged. May we be encouraged by the prophecy fulfilling of Jesus Christ. See, the world fades away when we see the provision of the Savior. The mundane nestles down to the bottom shelf when we see what Jesus Christ has done for you and for me. Not only do I see the prophecy in this passage, but I see some participants. 
want to draw your attention to three groups of participants. The first group of this of participants is found in verse number one and two, three, where Jesus sent two disciples. The Bible does not tell us which disciples got this errand of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who he sent, but he sent two. If you remember in Scripture, there are times that the disciples listened and followed and times that they didn't. Sometimes they were serving and doing the right things, and other times they were making a royal mess of things. I'm glad the Bible includes both sides because we fall into, the, into, that, into, the, into those illustrations, do we not? There are some times we're doing what we're supposed to, and other times we're making a royal mess of things. I think of the Apostle Peter, right? And uh, from one statement to, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, and, and Jesus commends him, and almost in the next breath, he says, Lord, you're not going to go die, and Jesus says, get thee behind me, all right? It's just, wow, it's just, it's just a mess, and, and good and bad. And here, I see the obedient participants. I see two disciples who were sent on a strange errand. Can you imagine this request? They've done a lot of strange things. But this is, this is right up there on the ones that are, that, that are interesting. Go across. Feed the crowd. Here he says, listen, go to the city over here. You're going to find this colt and the, the mother of the colt. They're going to be tied up and, and say the Lord had need of them if someone asks you and bring them to me. It's almost at first, it's almost at first that, that Jesus has said uh, to go steal them. Look at it, it almost, it almost appears that way. Except that Jesus can't steal anything that's already his. Right? If he owns everything, he can't take uh, wrongfully what is already his. And he sends these two disciples, and I, I wonder if not they're scratching their heads on the way to the city. Boy, what, we're doing what? Does he not know that everyone owns donkeys and mules. Does he not know this, this is going to be a mess? And there they go. And sure enough, just like Jesus said, I find two obedient disciples. The Bible says that in straight way, or that they, they did this. Verse number six, they went and they did exactly what God said for them to do. Their simple instructions, they simply followed them. May I challenge us to be like those two disciples who are nameless. And you and I may be nameless, but God knows the names. God knows as we follow Him. And the instructions may seem to be odd at times, but just simply follow the Lord. Be obedient. But I see another group of participants. Verse 8, the Bible says, In a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. The multitudes that went before them and that followed cried. I see a group of observant participants. In other passages, and it's found in each of the Gospels, the triumphal entry is found, we find that some of these disciples, or some of these, these of the multitude were disciples. They had seen, uh, not the twelve, they had seen Lazarus being raised from the dead. It shows us another place that, that many had seen the works of Jesus Christ. Or these people had no doubt knew of Jesus Christ because of his miracles. Maybe some had eaten of the bread, of the fish and the bread that he broke for them. Maybe some had been touched uh, in, in a physical way. Maybe some had been sick and now they were healed. Maybe some had, had a, a friend or a relative who was demon-possessed and now they weren't possessed any longer. Maybe they knew someone who was blind and now could see him. Maybe a friend had been healed and now could walk. They were observing because they had observed Jesus Christ. They had observed what he had done. They were still missing it. Jesus, wherever he went, the Bible tells us, he went about doing good. The Bible also tells us that the crowds followed him, hoping to see another miracle. They were there for what they could They were there for how they could be touched, how they could be fixed, and, and were willing to sacrifice something for that. 
observant. They knew that this was no ordinary man, though I believe they still missed who he was. Many did. But they knew he was no ordinary man. They said things like, wow, uh, no one could teach with such authority as this man teaches. And they missed who he was because they simply called him a prophet of Nazareth and of Galilee. He's from a poor place, a lowly place. But there were some that were opposing to Jesus Christ. In this passage, we see just a little bit of this. The book of John, that account gives us a clearer picture. In this passage, we see where the whole city, in verse 10, was moved saying, Who is this? In the book of John, chapter 12, verse 19, The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. You see, there were those who were obedient, there were those who were observant, but there were those who were opposing what was going on. The Pharisees could not handle that the crowds could follow Jesus Christ. They were opposing what he was doing. They were opposing every bit of his ministry. They had already been in negotiations for the betrayal of Jesus Christ. They already had secret meetings. How can we get rid of this guy? He is causing way too many problems for us, the religious leaders of the times. Opposition to Jesus Christ. There will always be opposition and those who object to the, the truth. There are those who reject Jesus Christ and anything remotely connected with him. You see, in the triumphal entry, it was not just about everyone just up praising There were those who sat back and said, this is terrible. This is awful. The whole world has gone after him. This can't be. They are so misguided, these crowd, these multitudes. They are so, they are wrong. Do they not know that we know the truth as the Pharisees, as the Sadducees, as the scribes? We know better than these, these poor, stupid people. There will always be opposition. And my my friend, Christian, listen, when you're out and about, there are going to be people who don't understand Jesus Christ. They won't understand why you'd come to church and come week in and week out and why you'd give your life for Jesus Christ and why you'd serve to Jesus Christ. Young people, God may call you to go to a Bible college and there'll be people who ask you, why are you going to Bible college? That seems like a waste of money. We, we, We go because we're trying to follow Jesus Christ. And there will always be opposition. Sometimes it will come from other people who ought to be more religious than they are. Sometimes it will even come from other Christians. Why are you so fanatical about that, Pastor? Why do you want us to actually say amen after a song that's a little bit too over the edge, it's too charismatic for us? No, I just want you to be genuine and authentic. I happen to believe that if God touches your heart, that you may do something about it. Because I know you do something about it if someone mischarges you at Walmart. I know you do something about that. Pastor Scott pointed out this morning, I know you do something about a a, a car if they cut you off. I know you do something about that. So why don't you do something about Jesus Christ in your life? And just be a little bit authentic and genuine when you come to church. It's okay to say amen. It's okay to stand up. It's okay to praise the Lord at church. I just ask you not to take a lap. I like to run. We'll go out the back doors and run. There's participants, but last in night, there's praise. The Bible says that they, multitudes, they cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. There was, first of all, there was true praise, and Jesus is deserving of our praise. They, they, they said this phrase, um, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Often, the Jewish tradition during this week, they would quote different psalms. And if, if you were to look at Psalm 118, I'll read part of it for you. But later on, you can read Psalm 118, and this is still done to this day, where they will quote these psalms. And Psalm 118 says this, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They were quoting the prophecy of Jesus Christ and praising God Almighty. True praise. I want to challenge us in one way tonight. Because there was true praise, but most of the praise that happened this day was temporal praise. Temporary praise. 
They were shouting. There was a bunch of hullabaloo. In fact, the city was moved, right? Who is this? What's going on? Coats being thrown down, palm branches, branches, trees, just a, just a mess of praise. The Pharisees up in arms. Everyone's disturbed. But just a few days later, the cries of Hosanna turn to crucify him. Just a few moments later, the cries of Hosanna, son of David, instead resound this way, release unto us Barabbas, we want Barabbas. Temporary praise. I'm afraid you and I are guilty of temporary praise. We come to church and we praise. Amen, brother. Amen, pastor. Amen, sister. Life is good, and we praise. Bills are paid, and we praise. Clean bill of health, and we praise. Job promotion, and we praise. No calamity, no trouble, and we praise. But the minute that life takes a downward turn, the minute that the pressures come in, our praises cease, and instead we turn back. God, how could you do that? I've been really good following you. God, how could you let this situation happen? Lord, I've really followed you all my life. I've been in church all the time. Lord, how could you let these things come? May our praise not be temporary, but our praise be real and relentless. May our praise be persistent and permanent. I fear that if we're going to be honest, if we were there that day, we'd fall into the, the ones who were praising with them while things were looking good. The minute the crowd turned, the minute that everything looked bleak, the praise changed. I want to challenge us to not be guilty of passing praise for our Savior. Passing. Sunday we praise and Monday we panic. Sunday it's all about Jesus Christ and Monday's all about JD's complaints. Sunday's all about his goodness. Monday, mess, passing praise. Charles Wesley, the first hymn that he wrote three days after he was saved was this song, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. First hymn he wrote. I am told that by the time he passed away, it is said that he, has, he had penned over 6,500 additional hymns and songs. We focus on ourselves. We inevitably see the sin, the failure, problems, and complications. No wonder we worry. No wonder our lives are a mess. No wonder that we're dejected and discouraged. But when we focus and renew our focus on our eternal Savior, our hearts are filled with awe and wonder for Him and for His holiness. We're reminded of His love as we search the Scriptures. We sit there in awe as our hearts are filled to the brim with His goodness. We're shown that His promises will never fail us. His presence will never leave us. We find that His mercies will never cease. And then, and only then, do we see that in our lives there is no room for self. There is no room for sin. There is only room for Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Palm Sunday. The triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. I challenge you tonight, tomorrow, and this week, that you turn your eyes... For Jesus, it was to be the hardest week he faced. Hardest week. For us, because of that week, the most glorious week. By the time we meet next Sunday morning, we're celebrating the resurrection. <laughs> 
Don't be guilty of passing praise. <laughs> God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, forgive me, forgive us for our frailty or the fickleness that we have. Lord, may we come to you with hearts of humility, souls stirred. Lord, you fulfill prophecy. You're the perfect provision. And Lord, we want to praise you. In a moment, we'll stand to our feet. And I wonder if you need to come back to praise. Come back to praise God. No matter what happens this week, no matter what happened last week, no matter what will happen this year, He's worthy of our praise. May we not be like that crowd. Lord, bless this invitation. May our hearts be stirred for you. In Jesus' name, amen.